All right. Um, thank you all so much for taking the time to attend. I just, uh, my name is Ali Lakani, and I work at La Trobe University. And I've had the pleasure of working with uh, quite a few people from AQA. And having said that, we've worked uh, for over a year now on a project or study where we've looked at the impact of multiple lockdowns on the health, service use, and quality of life of people with spinal cord injury who live in Victoria. And um, as a part of uh, our work, I'm here to present some of the findings that we have. Um, so before we begin, I just want to see. There you go. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, and, or the lands in which we meet, and um, and pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. I'd also like to acknowledge the work of the AQA Victoria peer support team. So whilst I'm presenting here and you'd see many of the peer support team members here, I'd also want to acknowledge that we collaborated towards uh, this work and that'll actually become apparent in some of the subsequent slides, how we work together. Um, having said that, it's important for me to acknowledge their work as well. And particularly here, Naz and Josh, thank you. And Sal, and Sal as well. Um, I thank, thank, all, thank all three of you for, for assisting and even others who were part of our initial brainstorms. So uh, I'd like to start with some take home messages. Um, peer support workers from AQA and researchers from Latrobe collaborated on a longitudinal study. So when I say a longitudinal study, simply put, we requested people with spinal cord injury to complete three surveys. Um, people with spinal cord injury living in Victoria completed a survey at three time points. One time point is termed lockdown one, which was the which asked participants to reflect on their experience from uh, from March 2020 until October 2020, where there was you know considerable restrictions in Victoria. Um, redru re during reduced restrictions, which was from October 2020 till um, May and June 2020, or sorry, October 2020 and May and June 2021. And then uh, lockdown two, which was a time period of uh, June 2021 to November 2021. So we asked people with spinal cord injury to complete three surveys and they coincided with lockdown one, a period of reduced restrictions and lockdown two. Um, reasons for seeking formal peer support differ during lockdown periods. And you'll see through some of the information that's presented that in be, living through lockdown has an impact on quality of life, participation, health service use, and health issues or health domains. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer in public health at La Trobe University. I'm an adjunct research fellow with Menzies Health Institute, Queensland at Griffith University. Historically, I was employed as a research fellow with Griffith University and my role was funded by the Motor Accident Insurance Commission Queensland during this time. I coordinate the Master of Public Health and Master of Public Health and Health Administration at La Trobe. I coordinate a variety of subjects and I have a reasonable amount of experience working with community-based uh, health and social service organizations. My research focuses on access to health services and um, factors that contribute to quality health services. Um, many of you would be well aware that peer support is characterized as the assistance and support provided by someone with a similar lived experience. For people with spinal cord injury, peer support has been identified as valuable for those who have recently experienced a spinal cord injury, um, uh, important to support aspects of participation, and contributes to increased resilience for people with spinal cord injury as well. Um, AQAV and peer support, the aim of peer support at AQAV is to assist those with spinal cord injury or sim similar disability to successfully return to life in the community. People facing life with spinal cord injury often have a great fear of what awaits them during and after rehabilitation. And the peer support team provides resources to help members and clients tackle issues of life. Um, the peer uh, AQA is about supporting people to connect, network, contribute, participate and build community life with spinal cord injury. Um, I'm stating the background about myself as well as peer support at AQA as we work collaboratively on this study. Um, thus, it's important to give some information about all of us. So 
Towards the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020, peer support workers from AQAV and researchers from Latrobe University were developing a survey which could be used to establish the health and well-being of members and clients. So we were having discussions around what type of information would be valuable to know about members and clients and um, how should we go about collecting it? Should it be annually? Should it be every two years, every five years? You know, I think it's timely. We've just ha seen reports about census results. We were aiming to do something to establish an understanding of how, what members and clients experience. So how many members and clients are working? What are the levels of participation, health issues, et cetera? So we were working around developing a survey which could be used to fill those knowledge gaps and support the practice of AQA and particularly the peer support team. So the survey was to include questions which could address a diversity of domains, including participation, peer support use and engagement, social health, general health, resilience, quality of life and health service access. Given COVID-19, the aim of this project shifted to establish peer support use, health status, health service use, resilience, participation, and autonomy and quality of life throughout the pandemic. So we were working together pre-pandemic on a survey and instrument. And throughout that time, we were making quite good progress. And then we experienced the pandemic, which we're all living through at the moment. And having said that, we had to shift our aim. So we thought it's still worthwhile to develop an understanding of what's going on with members of, and clients but perhaps throughout the period of the pandemic, developing this understanding could also be useful. So a longitudinal study was progressed with data collected at three time points. So um, participants completed a co-designed survey administered at three time points, right? So we developed a survey together. And you know, for those of you who have the screen view, You'll see I've outlined some of the steps that we work towards in completing a survey or developing survey measures. We followed a process to identify measures or questions to include in the survey. So essentially, step one was establishing the aims which we were working on. What do we want to gather or find out about? Step two was identify or conducting research to inform the measures that would be included in the survey. So during this step, University researchers scope the literature to establish which me measures have been used, right? And this information was then shared to people with lived experience, peer support workers throughout steps um, three, four, and five. And peer support workers reviewed those measures and gave advice around what they believed would be the best measure to use, particularly for their members and clients. And then throughout that process, it would, sometimes it was a circular process, but we uh, decided on a set of measures and a survey that we could use. So measures, we collected information, so demographic information, so information around the extent, or sorry, uh, age, uh, how, ma how many years have you been living with spinal cord injury, cultural background, um, uh, uh, socioeconomic status, um, gender, et cetera. So we collected some demographic information. We, collected, inf we collected information about the extent of formal and informal peer support. Um, so uh, informal peer support would be peer support provided by a, uh, someone who's employed in the role of peer support, for example, a peer support worker at AQA Victoria, or informal peer support would be support you may receive from someone else who is living with a spinal cord injury. Um, we collected information about the extent of health issues that one would experience and available health services. Um, we collected information about resilience, about participation and autonomy, and quality of life. So this is the information we collected at three time points through three surveys. So just as a recap, there were this slide has some information about social distancing periods. And the information that's on this slide isn't detailed in that there were you know, brief periods of lifted restrictions and changing restrictions, but these points on this slide are a general uh, idea. So the city of Melbourne experienced stringent lockdown from the end of June, 2020 until the end of October, 2020. From October, 2020 until June, 2021, measures were generally lifted. And while social distancing continued, 
It was at a level less stringent than previous. And then from June 2021 until September 2021, strict social distancing measures were reinstated. There were some gaps in periods where, where they were lifted due to a rise in cases in part due to the Delta variant. So what we see here is we have three distinct time periods. We have a time period where there were strict restrictions, so lockdown one. We have a time period where there were reduced restrictions. And then we have a time period where there were strict restrictions again, which has been termed in subsequent slides as lockdown two. Um, once again, there are some, you know, there are some nuances around how severe restrict or how strict strict restrictions were between urban and rural locations. And there are some brief time periods, particularly during that second lockdown from June 2021 to September 2021, where there was a lifting and reinstating of restrictions. Having said that, um, one could say that this is the pattern that was experienced. So what did we do? On this slide, we have um, two columns. The column on the left is the description of restrictions, which is what I've gone through on the previous slide. And the right column includes the data collection date and overarching research question. So during lockdown one, we asked people to, or people with spinal cord injury to answer questions based on their experience over the last six months. So over a period of lockdown, during lockdown one, we asked them, we asked that just at the end of that lockdown, we asked people with spinal cord injury to recount on their experiences during lockdown. And that was survey one, time one. Then for reduced restrictions during a period of time two, we asked people to uh, uh, respond to questions based on their experience over six months where there was reduced restrictions. And then during lockdown two or time period three, we asked participants to answer questions based on their experience over a previous six months. And during that six months, there was about four months of strict lockdowns. So we have responses for questions for time period one, which covered lockdown one, time period two, where there was reduced restrictions between lockdown one and lockdown two, and then time period three, which covered lockdown two, which was about four of the six months that we're asking people to respond based on. Okay, so data collection. Once again, it was demographic information, the extent of formal and informal peer support, extent of health issues and available health services, resilience, impact on participation and autonomy questionnaire, which essentially looks at participation and engagement in the community and quality of life. So analysis from survey three findings are not complete. And thus I'll be presenting findings which include a combination of lockdown one, redu reduced restrictions and lockdown two findings. So I'll present information from the three surveys. Mostly they'll be combined. So you'll be able to see a contrast, um, but these are not, this is not a final analysis. Some of it is pretty close to final, but th this will give you an idea of what's gone on during the three time periods. So our participants, we had 127 people who completed the first survey. The second survey, we had 71. And the third survey, we had 65. And this is pretty typical when you have multiple surveys that you have the most who complete the first survey and then it kind of tails off. Having said that, for our first survey, we had uh, 93 uh, male and 32 female participants. Um, the mean age was 52.92 or about 53. Um, 91 people completed tertiary education and 32 high school or under. Um, 65 were employed or engaged in an activity. So for example, they were working full-time, part-time or volunteering. Um, 24 were retired and 36 unemployed. People, for, 74 lived in metropolitan Melbourne and 47 in regional. 91 were homeowners and 30 were renting or on social housing. Um, in terms of uh, who people were living with, 99 of the 127 were with family and friends and 27 um, living alone. And uh, the primary health condition was paraplegia for 57 of the uh, participants. Finally, the mean, the average years of with condition or with spinal cord injury, living with spinal cord injury was approaching 16, right? So this was our, our demographics. As I stated, 
this is the, t the amount of people who completed the first survey. For the second survey, um, 72 participants completed it. And for the third survey, um, uh, 65. So, you know, what you see now or what I've just explained is not the same throughout, but it's pretty comparable. Can I ask yep. a quick question? Yep. So you said it's it's comparable with the proportions about the same? They are. They're at, okay, so I can say for the second survey, they are about the same. For the third, I'm in the middle of that. Okay. But for the second survey, they are pretty comparable. Okay, so during lockdown one, so we have a slide here which indicates the reasons for seeking peer support. And there are two columns for each domain, or sorry, two bars for each domain. And it, the blue bar is indicative of formal and the orange bar is informal. So what you'll see is the, the, the reasons for seeking peer support are as follows. Social support, connecting with organizations, um, ideas, motivation, problem solving, health concerns, equipment modification, general day-to-day -day living, coping with challenges, something NDIS or TAC related, carers, leisure, exercise, sexuality, other, and employment. Um, what you'll see is that, uh, that, that the domain which, which more, most people uh, use peer support, whether it be formal or informal, was for uh, social support and connecting with organizations. And then there are a series of, of domains which have pretty comparable uh, amounts, which were ideas, motivation, problem solving, health concerns, equipment modification, general day-to-day -day living, coping with challenges, right? And then there's a segment which is on the lower end um, where there was less percentage of participants who engage with peer support for the NDIS or TAC related for carers, leisure, exercise, sexuality, other, and employment. Um, generally, and this would make sense, that most people would engage with peer support through informal networks. So from someone else with lived experience who isn't necessarily employed or titled as a peer support worker. Um, having said that, uh, there are still a fair amount of people who engage with both. Now, the next slide. Can I ask? Yeah, on sure. That, on that, Ali. Sorry, yep. Mike. With this, obviously, this is a lockdown data. What is there a benchmark to com that's compare? And I may have missed it compared to non-lockdown times. Good question. So on the next slide, we have, um, and so any benchmark we would have for our current sample um, would still be contaminated because it's a period of reduced restrictions in between. Uh, strict lockdown in 2020 and strict lockdown in 2021, right? So our benchmark would be that middle period, which is still, you know, during a pandemic. So we wouldn't be able to compare it to something in 2019. We don't have, well, I don't have that information here. Um, having said that, this slide includes the percentage of participants who sought p formal peer support throughout the three time periods. So lockdown one during a period of reduced restrictions and lockdown two. And what you'll find for, we can go through them, for, for some domains, the way the pattern or the percentage of participants uh, change, it would make some sense. So for example, if we look at the domain motivation, if you look at lockdown one and lockdown two, compared to reduced restrictions, a greater percentage of participants contacted for or engaged with formal peer support to support motivation. Um, Similarly, you'd see the same for health concerns, coping with challenges, um, carers, um, ideas, uh, and, um, and uh, general day-to-day -day living and NDIS or TAC related, right? So the, for those domains, people engage with formal peer support or a higher percentage of people engage with formal peer support for those domains during lockdown compared to a period in between where there's reduced restrictions. At the same time, um, there are some where there's an upward trend regardless. So problem solving or connecting with people and organizations, the percentage of participants who engaged with formal peer support for those reasons increased during from lockdown to lockdown two. So lockdown one, they were at the lowest level and they increased during reduced restrictions and lockdown two. Same with um, exercise, leisure. So, um, you know, I'd be making assumptions here, 
perhaps individuals engaged with formal peer support to problem solve during the first lockdown and you know saw some benefit and continued to engage with them or that became a reason to engage during reduced restrictions and then lockdown too you know maybe um i'm completely theorizing here there isn't an evidence base to inform this because no one else has done this work to my knowledge as of yet you know it could also be that irrespective of lockdown people are experiencing challenges during this pandemic period lockdown restrictions or not and thus uh some domains are valuable or were sought people were seeking formal peer support throughout uh, all time periods for some domains right um I, I i would just throw out there the other point is that needs to be also considered as a limitation is that whilst in time one we had 127 people who completed the survey responses in time 271 time 365 you know even though we're saying 20% 15%, 20%, it's not the of the, the same total. It's not the same base, right? So um, that's a limitation that's worthy of consideration. At the same time, um, you know, there is some telling information, particularly around domains where there were increased participants seeking support for certain uh, domains during lockdown periods. It's pretty clear there are some that are, that are there, right? And I would only assume that it's because during that period of lockdown, um, people needed support, right? So the ones that that lend themselves to the relationship that you would expect, and what I say when I say relationship you'd expect, I'm saying increased percentage of people seeking support around motivate during lockdown periods or motivation, um, health concerns, coping with challenges, carers, uh, getting ideas, um, general day to day living. Um, uh, uh, these were domains where there was increased percentages of participants seeking formal peer support during periods of lockdown. I'm happy to come back to these slides at the end when there's some questions. Just I'll just get through some main points. So I have the same slide here for informal peer support. And this becomes interesting as well because the relationship isn't mirrored for that of formal peer support. Gen there are many domains here, or there are a few domains here where the seeking of informal peer support just continues to increase, okay? So particularly social support or just for a chat, health concerns, equipment modifications, ideas almost, exercise, leisure, general day-to-day -day living, these domains, Seeking for informal peer support, the, the percentage of participants seeking informal peer support across these domains increased. So lockdown one was the lowest level during a period of reduced restrictions were higher than that. And during lockdown two was even higher than that. So I don't know. I mean, maybe it's that people were, um, once again, we could have the issue that we're not dealing with the same base of participants. We have the, they're, sorry. They are the same people throughout, but the numbers get lower. So it's 127 the first round, 71 the second round, and 65 the third. Having said that, I could assume that um, seeking informal peer support increased during for these domains. Maybe um, people were doing so during time one and two, or time one identified value in that, and a greater number of people were doing that in time two, or percentage, and time three. Um, there's also at least one domain here where I see, or two domains where I see a similar relationship to uh, what we discussed for seeking formal peer support, particularly coping with challenges, issues around carers, and you know, to a marginal level in motivation, that there was an increased percentage of people who sought support in those domains um, during periods of lockdown, right? It would potentially be hard to measure but the, the social aspect of an informal peer support and obviously with prolonged lockdowns, perhaps, mm. the, the topics are less relevant as opposed to the actual conversation or reaching out. Do you think there would be a level to that? Yeah, very good point. So, you know, maybe the specific, um, and I think you might have raised that in a previous discussion and that, or I can't remember if it was Nas, or maybe a, a few it, it, would, it wouldn't have been Nas. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, the point you're raising is true. People might, you know, seek formal or informal peer support 
and it may not fit into these domains cleanly, or it may fit into several domains, right? I may call, it may even been Josh. I may call to have a chat about domain A and then end up talking about C, D, E, and F, right? And then where people categorize their, their main, their response to, we don't know. Would it be that they just focused on the main one that they would have sought and all the other stuff becomes marginal? We don't know. Um, and, and so that's a good point. We do have, there is another question, which is a very, it's a dichotomous question. Do you seek informal peer support? Have you sought formal peer support? I haven't presented that information here. Um, I could run, I will run the, the frequencies for that, but that would be more towards what you're saying. Just, did you seek informal peer support? Yes or no? Have you sought formal peer support? Yes or no? And we're not, not as much concerned about the, the reasons. I think the other thing relating to Ant's thing is formal peer support, the social support and just for a chat dropped off over the three time periods where it went up for informal peer support. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so it's, I think it's important to, as you're watching, to look at the patterns in combination, mm -hmm. right? So maybe it's that people are seeking less formal peer support and they're, they're supporting themselves through mm -hmm. informal peer support, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Very true. And then there may be some distinct issues or points around the, uh, the domain themselves that lend themselves to, to be sought by some uh, to informal support. Yeah. So look, if we go previous, so I think which ones were you speaking of? The social support. Just, yeah. Just for a chat. So that dropped off mm -hmm. for formal. Yeah. And then if you flip to the next slide, it goes up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's a good point. And there's, you know, we could dissect different patterns mm -hmm. throughout. Like there are a lot of domains here. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it, I, I find it useful to look at it across a three time period. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we also asked which health services are inaccessible for you, right? During all three surveys. And this uh, graph includes data or present or uh, data. Is, there's an illustration for time one, which is during lockdown one and time two, which is reduced restrictions. Okay. The, the legend at the bottom doesn't say lockdown one and reduced restrictions, but it's the same. It's T1 and T2. And the pattern here um, is what you'd expect with the exception of one domain. So across all these health services, general practitioner, urologist, OT, physio, specialist rehabilitation, masseuse, um, podiatrist, and special spinal service one and special spinal, spinal service two, there were a greater percentage of participants who indicated that these were inaccessible during the first time period. Okay, compared to the second time period where there were reduced restrictions. And this would make sense. Health services, the community opened up during the second time period. And, um, you know, there was, uh, there was closure during the first time period. You know, it would be telling to see what happens during the second lockdown. I haven't crunched that number, but you can see here that that relationship is clear. Mm -hmm. That there is a drop off in inaccessible health services is double negative. It becomes challenging. There's a drop off in, in inaccessible health services. Um, during uh, the period of reduced restriction. Yeah. Okay, agree. No one uses it. Okay. Now, secondary health issues. So we asked over the previous six months, have you been experiencing these health issues? So T1, that six month is that extended lockdown for lockdown one and T2 is the period of reduced restrictions. And what you'll see here generally is that health issues go up. So what, what's really, I, I don't want to say interesting, right? Because it's people's lives. <laughs> what's, it's intriguing. It, yeah, it's intriguing, right? Because so prior to this study, there were a lot of, there were many people who theorized that we're going to see a spike in health issues after the pandemic, which never, the after has never come, but, or after lockdown, mm. they're saying we're going to see a spike in health issues. You know, there's been a, there's been a fair amount of studies that have found that, look, there's increased emergency department presentations because people can't go to GP, those sorts of things. And, and, and there's also the people who theorized and said that, look, there's going to be an increase in secondary health issues for people who have a, you know, a specific health issue because there wouldn't be health support during a period of lockdown. This shows that 
this relationship shows that sorry this this graph shows that that might be the case so when you look at period one versus period two um there is and and i need to also make clear for this graph and the previous graph this is just 71 people who completed uh period two so it is entirely the same base same slice, right yeah. same slice of people yeah. the first two graphs where i looked at health um reasons for seeking peer support that's not the case mm -hmm. but for this graph and the previous graph it is only based on the 71 people who completed survey two mm -hmm. so for them you can say they said that so you know about 45 percent of people said that they had neuropathic pain during the six six months of lockdown um uh during the period of restri reduced restrictions there was 55. um sexual dysfunction went up um spasticity stayed the same UTIs increased, shoulder problems increased, um, bowel incontinence increased, and there's a diverse, you know, trouble sleeping, you can see that there was increase. Now, I've done some other inferential analysis, which I'm not going to present here today. But what you can find is, if you look at two domains, shoulder problems, okay, and UTIs, okay, you'd see, sorry, so there's, there were two services which were significantly less accessible during period one okay when you do inferential analysis is not presented here the stat the coefficients are not here there were two services which were significantly less accessible during period one those were physiotherapists and urologists right so there are some health conditions here which would have been supported by a physiotherapist or a urologist and you can see that they've increased during the period of reduced restriction now there's many theories on this maybe some of these issues were salient they have no symptoms and they only got diagnosed during time two okay um maybe not i don't know i don't live with these conditions or some of these conditions i don't live with having said that you can tell that there's been an increase generally of health issues during the period of of post lockdown okay um yeah that that's interesting i, I know that's neuropathic pain but with generalized pain i don't know if have conversations and other stuff that we're working on but but to me that's interesting that in period of lockdown so you would expect higher levels of inactivity mm. that there are studies that say that high levels of acti activity for some people can reduce pain mm. where you would think in high levels of inactivity, some people's pain, generalized pain, yeah. not, not neuropathic pain, but generalized pain mm. would go up. So that that that's interesting. Um, I mean, that'll be potentially something interesting to look at. Um, yeah. Well, even to your point, there's some who would say that, well, look, shoulder problems, well, maybe those who are in, in reduced restrictions, they were more active mm. and that can contribute to so shoulder problems, right? It could be that as well. I don't know. Yeah, it went too hard too soon. Right. So. Yeah, so that, that's it too. Maybe you have a period of sedentary or you're dormant and then mm. you know, you're actually active subsequent to that and maybe you get injured yourself because of that. At the same time, you could still make the claim that it was due partially due to a, a lockdown period that caused it. But you wouldn't be able to make the link that it's specifically because health services are not accessible. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so I'll keep going, but but we can we can chat. UTIs is interesting too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 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 there's a point here. Now the remaining slides present information and they're very simple. They're line graphs that include data points for the three time periods. Okay. And these graphs would be the same participants. On the same 60 the same 61 or however many completed the responses at the three time points okay. right yep. so the highest it'll be a 65 participant yep. right because it's time three it's 65 participants mm. so i don't have the ends for each graph mm. subsequent in future i will but the, you can just see the pattern here right and there's some of them there are significant differences for the three time periods for some some there isn't significant differences i don't have those coefficients here but we ask people to complete questions regarding their quality of life okay and life satisfaction so this graph includes life satisfaction at three time points mm -hmm. life satisfaction during lockdown one was at the lowest it increased during reduced restrictions and trended downwards again during lockdown two mm -hmm. okay and 
some of this would be obvious. You'd easily be able to theorize, well, you know, my life satisfaction is going to go down during periods of lockdown. Physical health. Lockdown one, people said their physical health, they rated, it's a self-rating of physical health, right? We asked on a scale of zero to 10, indicate how satisfied you are with your physical health. Similarly, how satisfied you are with your life. And the next one will be psychological health. How satisfied you are with psychological health. So during lockdown, people, people the, the values or the satisfaction was lower during lockdown for physical health, right? which is somewhat interesting because we just saw the previous slide that showed that people had shoulder problems, et cetera, and many physical ailments during this reduced restrictions period. But I guess on the whole, people still said they were more satisfied with their physical health during a period of lockdown. Oh, sorry, during the period of reduced restrictions. Psychological health for our cohort who completed the three surveys improved. Well, they were happy to go into a second lockdown. Right. So, you know, I've talked to other academics about this and it could be, you know, theorizing again. OK, after reduced restrictions during lockdown, too, we know there's a vaccine. We know that there's an end in sight. We've had a period of reduced restrictions just before this lockdown, too, was not as severe as lockdown one. It wasn't a firm five months or whatever with, you know, apparently no end in sight. There was blips of of of. Um, not being in, in restrictions. It was four months of a six month period that we collected data over, mm -hmm. right? Even jokingly, I'm not gonna call them out. I spoke to someone from peer support because I was not here during that time period. And they said, and I've heard many people anecdotally say that, oh, many people aren't even following the rules. Yeah. So, you know, who knows? But, but where does JobKeeper coming along here? <laughs> yeah, so that's another point too. So JobKeeper yeah. remained throughout this whole period, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right? But, but even from a psychological point, point of view, one of the key foundations is for, for people's wellness is safety. So a sense of safety in lockdown, mm. as you say, factors of that high level vaccine mm. and then, but that safety aspect of I'm vaccinated and I'm protected. Yeah. And potentially that mindset subconsciously. Could be there. Yeah. Could Stop, be there. Stockholm syndrome. Completely so, different. <laughs> completely. <laughs> so, so, so this is, this is, this is, this was something interesting, right? Because I would have assumed that, look, it would have gone down, but there's you can rationalize either or, and you can only theorize, right? Um, the, the talking about mass life. But with this this group of people, it would be interesting, I guess, from the perspective of you've got carers coming into your home, mm -hmm. and again, okay. if you've got a sense that there's a vaccine, you feel safer about people coming into your mm -hmm. home than you might have in the first mm -hmm. lockdown as well. Pro yeah, the processes were more known. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. So then quality of life as a whole. Okay. Mm. So the three measures, the three questions before, it's very simple. They're summed and you get a quality of life measure. This is the international quality of life data set. That's the three domains they use. So quality of life was lowest during lockdown one, highest during a period of reduced restrictions, and then trended down again towards lockdown two which is, you know, what you would somewhat assume, but it wasn't as drastic. The drop wasn't as drastic. Mm -hmm. um, okay, number of health issues. Mm -hmm. Once again, now, this is the same cohort of people. Time this one, two, self, three. Self-perception. So, well, this is, these are, okay, so remember we had that slide of health yeah. issues? This is just the sum. Yeah, okay. The mean number of health issues okay. for time one, so lockdown one, reduced restrictions, and lockdown two. Health issues were lowest apparently during lockdown one. During the period of reduced restrictions, they increased and they continued to increase during lockdown two. So was that lockdown one so dramatic in terms of people's health, be it not access to health services, not being able to physically move? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Was that so dramatic that it encouraged or resulted in health, uh, health issues emerging subsequent and continuing to rise? Because some have said that the extent of health issues will be long-standing beyond the lockdown period, right? And, you know, some of those health issues, I would take it to those with lived experience and clinicians, frankly, maybe they're not easily remedied once there's the onset of them, right? I don't know, but there, there's too many to, to list there or to, to theorize about. This is on a whole, this is an aggregate. So anyone who said I had sexual dysfunction, 
um, uh, shoulder pain and fatigue, they'd get a score of, they get a number, it was a count. So they got three. There was 15, I think, health issues that we wrote. So, you know, they're, the highest could be 15. I believe the highest we had during any period was 11. One, yeah, so that one person, seriously, had 11, mm -hmm. right? That would, be, that would be quite a terrible scenario for that person. Having said that, so this is what happened with health issues during the three time period. Okay, number of health services labeled as inaccessible. Greater number, greater mean number during lockdown one reduces, you know, during reduced restrictions and starts to increase again during lockdown two, right? So these are the number of health services that were seen as inaccessible during the three time periods. Um, and this is the pattern that you'd expect. You know, lockdown one, we're not able to go into health services, et cetera, reduce restrictions. So things open up, you can go to some and then restrictions heighten again and you can't go to them again. Um, so this is what you would, ex would be expected. Now, the final three slides are pieces of information that haven't, you know, th these, the, the final three slides are around participation and community engagement, okay? So we use the um, participation and autonomy questionnaire, which includes several domains. And a higher number in a domain means you have more difficulty in that domain, okay? So we have a domain around outdoor engagement or outdoor autonomy. So being able to do what you'd like outdoors, having a higher number on that measure would mean that you have poorer autonomies, increased difficulties or increased barriers. Okay, so for the three time points, difficulties impacting outdoor autonomy. So outdoor engagement or being able to do things outdoor that you wish. During lockdown one, it was the highest, right? During reduced restrictions, it went down. And during lockdown two, it's marginally higher than during reduced restrictions, right? Yeah, just. So, I mean, it makes, you'd understand why lockdown one had uh, increased, people had, there was a higher level or higher number or mean number of difficult, higher score indicating higher uh, increased barriers or difficulties. But, you know, it appears as though once there was reduced restrictions, those reduced and they didn't, the difficulties didn't increase to a considerable amount during lockdown two. Once again, there was a reduced amount of time that people were in lockdown during lockdown two, it was not as much. There were blips of times where there weren't, we weren't in lockdown, but you know, this is just telling. It says that there was increased difficulties during at least that first lockdown impacting outdoor autonomy. Um, difficulties impacting social life and relationships. So this is social health social engagement, increased difficulties during lockdown one, reduced during reduced restrictions, starting to increase again during lockdown two, right? Which would make sense because of restrictions. And I think there's a final one, difficulties impacting work and education. You know, the, the, what's going on is clear here as well. During lockdown one, we had a lot of difficulties or barriers inhibiting our ability to do work and education. And then it uh, reduced or difficulties and barriers reduced during reduced restrictions and then increased again during lockdown too. That's interesting. Mm. Now, so what are the take home messages? This, this, this uh, replicates this third slide or fourth slide. So peer support workers from AQA and researchers from the Trobe collaborated on a longitudinal study. People with spinal cord injury living in Victoria completed a survey at three time points. Reasons for seeking formal peer support differ during lockdown periods. And lockdown doesn't have an impact on quality of life, participation, health service use, and health domains. And, you know, based on the impact on these domains, there is a unique place for health and social care providers to support these outcomes. Um, so having said that, for those who are uh, physically here and those who are virtually here, um, you know, the next couple or the next slide, I just have some questions for discussion or I open the floor.